Thank you so much. So we are starting right now this panel that is called a interregional conversation, effective tools for secure free data flows. Can you hear me? Yes, this uh, moderator is asking. We are here. We are just about to start, and so we will have we will have with us Gladys Giro, John Zirin, Javier Lopez Gonzalez, and we will give the floor in order to have opportunities in this context where regions of the world are exchanging some flows. I'm listening to you across boundary if data flows that make uh, possible that they should f be secure free data flows so we will I will introduce Clarice Giro she's the first of our members of the panel Clarice was graduated on the law school of Paris University to Afas uh, Pantheon with a private uh, law and uh, property, intellectual property. She has also a master's degree at Oxford and also comparative law by the Imburg Institute of the Stilburg University. This is on the uh, um, Netherlands. Dr. Clarice is the chair of uh, Director of Asia Pacific at Future of Privacy Forum. Uh, the siege is at S Singapore. She is in charge of implementing a strategy of a private forum for strategies in the future in the largest area and most populated area of the world. She is a member of data production of Jasburg and also a private expert of networks of Asia, of the Global Reference Panel, of the Assembly of a Private Network, and also she's member of the Future Society. We will ask Clarice Giro to take the floor. Thanks for um, inviting me to contribute uh, to this very important conversation about data transfers, um, arguably one of the most complex to understand uh, in the global world we, we live in. And uh, thanks to data flows, actually, we are um, together uh, today uh, or tonight, uh, depending on where we sit. Um, so we're extremely grateful to our friends at INAI for making this uh, possible despite all uh, hardships. So just um, I have a few um, introductory points to make. Um, I think we have 10 minutes to, to sort of set the scene um, before diving into the conversation, um, all of us. Um, and for my, my brief introduction, I wanted to make three points. Um, and the first point is actually relates to uh, a personal um, experience. Um, I started working in the area of data protection uh, and privacy on Monday, September 3rd, 2001, uh, exactly 20 years, one month and 15 days uh, ago. I joined the CNIL, the French Data Protection Authority, when we were just in the home stretch of the organization of the International Conference of Data Protection and Privacy Commissioners at the time, which was taking place um, on September 24 and 25th, 2001. And one of the topics for discussion on the program was cross-border data flows and uh, the new standard contractual clauses that the European Commission had adopted um, in June 2001. And uh, we were reviewing the safe harbor decision one year on because the safe harbor had been adopted the year before. And then eight days after I joined CNIL, um, September 11, 9-11 um, uh, occurred. Uh, this dramatic event changed so many things. Uh, first of all, everything was upset, of course, but then it was also the beginning of a long series of extraterritorial laws being passed um, in the United States in particular, but also all around the world to make sure that 
um, we could basically deal with the aftermath of this dreadful attack. Um, and so um, this is how it all started. The, the um, US Aviation and Transportation Security Act um, in November 2001 uh, introduced a requirement that airlines operating passenger flights to the US uh, provide the US authorities upon request with electronic access to PNR data, passenger name record data. Um, an agreement was signed between the EU and the US in 2004, but it was denounced by the European Court of Justice uh, in 2006. So all this sounds extremely familiar. Um, as you can realize, I mean, 20 years back already, we were having these difficult conversations around um, data flows, how to, um, how to strike the right balance in the complex world that we already lived in at the time. And between now and um, between then and today, uh, we have seen many, many more developments. We have BCRs, we have more SCCs, we have more adequacy decisions, we have GDPR, we have CCPA. So it looks like not everything has changed, but a lot actually has changed. And in this particular year, um, 2021, um, some dramatic changes have occurred that we might not have all realized. And these uh, changes reveal the complete globalization of policy and rulemaking in the area of data protection and data flows. What was for a very long time mainly a transatlantic discussion between the EU and US, the epicenter de facto um, in, of you know, policy and rulemaking in the area of data flows, um, that has changed. Uh, we now have a very broad community of regulators and everyone is uh, looking at the same issues wherever we sit um, in the globe. And uh, this year, 2021, uh, China personal information protection law. India is due to finally uh, adopt uh, its own data protection law. We will have a sea change happening in this part of the world. A great number of um, countries, jurisdictions in Asia Pacific now have data protection laws. And this is the work uh, that I did at the Asian Business Law Institute until recently and still carry on uh, under FPF at the Future of Privacy Forum. We have shown how uh, virtually all data protection laws in Asia Pacific now include data transfer provisions which have led an increasing number of jurisdictions to adopt data transfer tools adapted to the region. And I believe that Zikin uh, will, will uh, mention this uh, later. Now, what did this uh, change? And that will be my, my third comment. Um, I think we need to take a step back and reflect about um, why we have these regulations in the first place, instead of always focusing on the how. Uh, we need to, to, have a, a, to take a holistic approach to uh, data transfers and avoid the temptation to transform these topics into excessively technical uh, subject reserved for, for specialists. I hope you hear me well because there's a lot of echo for me. It's not a very comfortable conversation, but I hope you, uh, you, you can still hear what I say. Um, let me give you an example for this, uh, this uh, third point that I want to make. Um, I am currently in Germany, not in Singapore. Uh, I actually could fly from Singapore, which has fairly strict uh, still COVID policies, to Germany under a vaccinated travel lane. And that means that I could actually leave Singapore on a specific flight to Germany because the right conditions were put to this travel. Um, I was vaccinated, the airline had taken necessary precautions so that on the flight itself, there were a number of precautions taken so that the, the, safe, the trip could be free and safe at the same time. But this was not enough. In other words, the data transfer in itself was safe, but we needed more conditions for this vaccinated traveling to happen. We need to have trust between the country of origin and the country of destination that once you know, the data or the passengers leave or land somewhere, basically the same kind of conditions will apply. There will be trust on both sides. In other words, um, this is actually a, a parallel which has its limits, 
but we can actually rely on safe and free data flows, not only because we have um, adequate data transfer mechanisms put in place by data controllers, by companies like airlines, for instance, but also because there is trust between governments, between jurisdictions as to the conditions um, in which these transfers can take place and how the data will be collected and processed uh, further down the road. Um, this is essential. We tend to lose the forest for the tree. It's, data transfer regulation is not only about adopting tools, it's not only about specialists discussing complex uh, implementation of tools, it's really about building commonalities, common understandings wherever we sit in the world between jurisdictions and find convergence in everything uh, we do. This is the work um, that we have been doing at the Asian Business Law Institute and also under uh, the aegis of the Future of Privacy Forum. And I'll be happy to, um, to expand on this a bit uh, later. And again, I apologize if my presentation is a bit uh, clumsy, but it's, it's not very comfortable to speak right now. John C. Rin is our speaker and he is Deputy Commissioner at Personal Data Protection Commission from Singapore, where he oversees the management and implementation of personal data protection. Zirin, he is uh, well known internationally because of, he belongs to an intelligence agency he works for. He's a member of the network experts from the O. ECD. In 2019, Sirin, he was member of the group of experts of the OCDE and ODCE, and, um, and uh, he was also member of some other organizations. And uh, he was also a member of the G20 since uh, some years ago. Also, he is an expert well known in the terms of personal data protection. He has been contributing to some uh, articles in regards to the protection, data protection, and uh, for international and national uh, agencies. At present time, he participates as an expert of the task group of governance of intelligence, artificial intelligence the agency. This is He's given the uh, acronym, and it is more focused on data protection issues and the intersection of development of artificial intelligence. And also, I would like to mentioned that he has been a lecturer in he has been participating in different journals. He has a good uh, experience as a lawyer and also both for the private and the public sector. So I am very pleased to ask uh, Mr. Zirin to take the floor. Good morning. Uh, good afternoon. Good evening. Uh, it's my pleasure to join you. Um, this morning from Singapore. Uh, thank you for the invitation for me to uh, participate at this uh, conference. I'm pleased to use this opportunity to share Singapore's views on cross-border data flows and data protection, which are important aspects in a digital economy. Today, I'd like to focus on our initiative and efforts uh, within ASEAN, the Association of South Asian Nations, and also the APEC, the Asia Pacific region. The Southeast Asian region is brimming with opportunity. We have over 100,000 users who go online each day. The digital economy in ASEAN is estimated to increase by the regional GDP by 1 trillion over the next 10 years. 
ASEAN uh, has a diverse um, data protection landscape ranging from countries that have general data protection laws, some countries who are in the process of enacting such laws, and other countries that are still governed by different sectoral regulations. The approach towards data protection and privacy varies from country to country, with countries in different the lack of organization um, in the region poses complex issues for businesses that operate within ASEAN. Despite this complexity, uh, ASEAN member states have banded together in recognition of the importance of facilitating free but free interflows to support the growing digital economy in this region. To this end, um, ASEAN member states have signed the agreement on electronic commerce and launched the ASEAN Digital Master Plan in 2025 with a view of developing a unified digital market in the region. Given the different approaches, how then can data transfers be facilitated for ensuring comparable protection? When the Asian Business Law Institute a comparative review of the mechanism in Asian jurisdiction, it identified contract binding of the rules certification as having potential for participants, while consent means adequate for dual contract. Consent and contract are part of the global data transfers on which interoperability of global data and privacy regime while consent is added for residual it is cumbersome for systematic or recurrent transfers, especially when it is common uh, change to either distance part quickly. But virtual clauses are widely by businesses around the world. They allow a business to data protection security requirements of the receiving party. A widely known example is standard contractual clause first promulgated in and updated just this year. In ASEAN, we introduced the ASEAN clauses, a flexible uh, that was introduced this year and uh, recognized by ASEAN member states. And we have been using this since The ASEAN contractual clauses are terms and conditions that companies make binding legal agreement between businesses across this use across ASEAN, whether the ASEAN has a general data protection law, whether it has a data authority, or whether it is still governed by the regulation. The development of the model of pressure clauses were born with or out of attention to help ASEAN businesses meet data protection standards and ensure that personal data help businesses are safeguarded, increasing assistance and participation in the digital economy. We rely on the ASEAN 
The obligations that are the model contractual clauses derive from the asset framework on the on personal data protection and are aligned and are aligned with global best practices to ensure accountability. Obligations uh, fundamental principles of data protection as articulated um, um, in the ASEAN uh, framework for personal data protection, which I mentioned. Which are, and it is also very similar to the ATAC privacy principle and the OECD principles as well. Now, in the longer term, a certification as a mechanism for data transfer also goes great as another global norm. A number of countries, Republic of Korea, Japan, Singapore, we all take this. Certification systems. Um, even the EU has certification as a mechanism. So, uh, th this is a um, to see how certifications uh, may be a mechanism in and of itself. Uh, the example of this uh, is actually the cross border. Private. Uh, within ASEAN, we have created an intention to develop the system as part of the ongoing work to secure cross border data flow within ASEAN. Um, move on to talk about uh, regional efforts for consolidation because data is not and cannot be geographically bounded. Uh, we have to look beyond um, our, the coherence of uh, regulatory frameworks around the world through pursuing interoperability as well as the convergence as legitimate interests. Uh, as mentioned earlier, the communication transfer mechanism uh, with uh, APEX ERP systems are, are a good example. These are comprehensive education systems that can enable trusted cross border data flow and uh, which also ensure a baseline uh, level of data governance protection uh, across the participating APEX systems. Uh, there are currently nine economies uh, in the CPP um, systems, uh, including Singapore, Japan, China, Taipei, Republic of Korea, Philippines, and the United States of America. Um, further, in building the convergence, um, Singapore has also pioneered nations, uh, digital economy agreement, which align common digital digital trade in cross border through the um, data in the EEA. We have signed such digital agreements with Chile, uh, New Zealand, and uh, in Australia, with Australia. And we are currently negotiating a similar agreement with Cambodia and recently launched a uh, with the United Kingdom as well. Apart from ensuring that our mechanisms can be widely used, we can also look towards aligning various different concepts within the lexicon of data transfers across various jurisdictions. So we mentioned um, concept, right? Um, these have out a multiple uh, data protection regime. Um, if we work on a common interpretation and uh, practices that apply and these concepts, 
uh, there can be conversion and there can be interoperability around common concepts like this. And these were uh, new bridges for us uh, uh, to, to build the uh, In addition to what we spoke about earlier, communications and concepts. Um, in conclusion, I'm looking towards a building and understanding. It would be useful to build a global combination of practical examples and new cases to provide certainty to the and to reduce their need for the purpose of uh, processing. Uh, there are other areas that, um, that require further discussion and appropriate platforms such as this. For example, the ability for um, law enforcement to access and request for data. So I thank you for the attention thus far and look forward to having a deeper discussion uh, on these topics uh, when the panel comes right out of this. Thank you. He's also a scholar and representative of the House of Representatives for Data Protection Affairs. He is director of CELIS, that is the Center of Studies of Internet and Society, and member of the board of the International Association of Privacy Professionals and of the ID, that is the consulting, uh, that is consulting commissioner of the privacy group for the UN and of the consulting member of uh, data consumption and data for children at Adana Institute. He was general coordination at the National Ministry of the Ministry of Justice and is author of a number of papers, books for uh, a number of uh, topics, including data protection. So now, Danilo, we are ready for you. Pleasure to me to be in the Global Privacy Assembly again. Well, we are talking about cross-regional conversation regarding to regarding regarding international data transfers. First. Uh, the panel asked us to talk about effective tools, and the first thing I would like to bring into our, into our conversation is what is effective in terms of international data transfers. What is being asked for, from international transfers to be effective? And as far as I've been following the discussion, I'm based in Brazil, and I'm following the conversation internationally, of course, but in Brazil, we have a new law, a uh, law which is one year old right now, last September. It was its first birthday. And the international data transfers has begun to be, uh, is, to be an issue in Brazil. And when we talk about efficiency, international data transfers, what we see in Brazil mostly is the conversation regarding the possibility of implemented by the industry by 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 by, by, by the effect of international data transfers we had now we will now ask javier lopez gonzalez to take the floor he is senior trade policy analyst of the oecd javier lopez gonzalez is an economist head of the Director's Office of Agriculture and Commerce for the OECD. His most recent uh, work focuses on trade in the digital era, development of schemes for digital commerce, and also research on what the openness of the 21st century is all about, as well as regulatory notions for the transborder flow of data, including the, tra the relevance of uh, digital trade. He was part of mechanisms and involvement of value chains at a global level. 
He has a PhD on economy. So we will ask Javier Lopez Gonzalez to take the floor. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. Um, so uh, I had a set of slides that I was going to present. Um, yes, thank you very much. Okay, what I want to talk about is uh, some work that we've done at the OECD, which aims to uh, build on the understanding of the differences across countries and the way they approach cross-border data flows. And rather than focus on these, to try and focus on the commonalities or what makes us more similar uh, with a view to finding common ground uh, which will enable greater dialogue on ways of enabling data flows with uh, trust. And this is work that we've presented at the G20, at the G7, at the APEC, and at the WTO. As you can see, that large range of uh, stakeholders, all in different areas. I'm also probably the odd one out here in that I'm an economist and I'm from the trade world. Uh, so I'm learning a lot from what I'm listening, and I hope that my sort of view of looking at this is helpful for others. Can we go to the next slide, please? So but while we go to the next slide, what I want to talk about is the four types of approaches to cross-border data transfers, and I will talk about three of these. We've largely covered in our discussions what I refer to as unilateral mechanisms, and we've discussed some plurilateral arrangements in the previous sessions with mention to the APEC CDPR, for instance. And there has also been some discussions on trade agreements. Uh, but the last approach, which I think is important, that I won't be able to talk about in this session, is about standards and technology-driven initiatives. And that's sort of a greater focus on the use of privacy-enhancing technologies to transfer data across borders. If we can go to the next slide, please. So the first type of approach I want to focus on are these unilateral mechanisms. And these are, sorry, we could go to the next slide. These are domestic mechanisms that enable the transfers of certain types of data abroad under certain uh, conditions. And these are largely in the context of personal data. And we think it's useful here to differentiate between open safeguards and pre-authorized safeguards. And what I mean by these are basically open safeguards are those that leave discretion as to how to safeguard first the private sector, which include approaches such as the one in the US with exposed accountability or the use of contracts or private sector adequacy, something that we see being used in Australia. And then we have the pre-authorized safeguards, which require public sector approval before transfer. And they include public adequacy decisions, standard or pre-approved contractual clauses and binding corporate rules, all of which have been mentioned uh, in what we've been discussing. So when we look across these instruments across 56 economies, what we start seeing are some similarities. For instance, adequacy is something that is used in the open safeguards as well as in the reauthorized safeguards. And the notion of contract also appears. Again, the difference largely being about whether it's the public sector that determines these or if more discretion is left to the private sector. The next type of approach I'm going to talk about are plurilateral arrangements, where we're seeing a relatively complex landscape. And these are essentially international instruments that create rules or generate consensus around the transfers of specific types of data. And in this context, these are largely developed in the area of privacy and data protection. And so these are the OECD privacy guidelines, these are the uh, APEC CDP, this is Convention 108, uh, and these can be either binding or non-binding. And one of the things that we look at in this area is that we go very deep into the issues and the principles that are covered in the Privacy and Personal Data Protection Regulation. And what we find is that there is a very high degree of overlap in these principles. We find, for instance, that um, some principles like the right, uh, sorry, the right to rectification, security and confidentiality or use limitation appear in 100% of the privacy regulations that we identify. 
where there is less commonality perhaps is on issues such as the rights to data portability or the rights of deletion. But very importantly, the overlap across these 56 economies that we look at is of 60, 68%. And the overlap is bigger across members of particular plurilateral arrangements, such as APEC CBPR, such as Convention 108, or the OECD privacy guidelines. The last area that I want to cover are these trade agreements and partnerships. So what we are witnessing in terms of the trade agreement is that there is a growing number of countries which are introducing data flows. And these are different to the ones I mentioned earlier, particularly because they include personal, but also non-personal data flows. And here we have three categories of trade agreements. We have those that are non-binding and they provide guidance, which have broad provisions reaffirming the importance of data flows. An example is the Korea-Peru FTA. And those occupy around 45% of the agreements that are currently in place. Then we have those agreements that reassess that provide for a reassessment of data flow provisions in the future. And those are the example of these ones are in New Mexico, for instance. And then the last one are those that provide binding rules relating to the transfer of all types of data. For example, the US, Mexico, and Canada agreement, or the Comprehensive and Progressive uh, CPTPP agreement. What's really important to notice in the way that trade agreements are being formulated is that all agreements with binding provisions also require or promote the adoption of domestic privacy and data protection legislation. Moreover, when we look at the evolution of agreements in time, we see that these are in time becoming increasingly binding. So the agreements would provide a non-binding guidance for those that prevailed from 2006 till about 2014 and 2015. Since 2014-15, we've seen a big move towards providing binding rules on cross-border data flows. But these also include relatively broad exceptions, which can vary quite a lot in terms of privacy or for national security. So what I want to highlight, and I want to end with this, is that the analysis looks at a range of different instruments and it highlights that there is no single mechanism to enable what has come to be known as the free flow of data with trust. Indeed, what we identify are governments pursue very different or even multiple and also complementary approaches. But I want to leave you with the three C's of the analysis. The first one, which was already mentioned, and if we can go to the last slides, please. I think it's in a, in a few. Um, the, the first C is the commonalities, and these are found between and within instruments. And what I mean by these commonalities is that the dual goals of safeguarding data and enabling its flow across borders is something that we find common across all instruments. That is, trade agreements, unilateral or plurilateral arrangements. The second C is convergence, which has already been mentioned by Clarice as well. And what we identify here as data is that there is growing convergence. We see that trade agreements are increasingly combining data flow provisions with requirements for privacy. And we also see that the principles that underpin domestic privacy and personal data protection are having increasing overlaps. And so the direction of travel, even though we're starting from a lot of differences, is towards a form of convergence, at least within the different in instruments. And the last C, which I want to leave you with, is that there is a high degree of complementarity between instruments. For instance, unilateral mechanisms draw from, and they also contribute to the plurilateral arrangements. We've heard earlier about the standard contractual clauses being developed in, in, in ASEAN, for instance. And also, we're increasingly seeing trade agreements referencing plurilateral arrangements with, for example, references to the OECD privacy guidelines or to the APEX CPR. So I want to leave it at that. And what I want to highlight is that I think that uh, in order to try and build sort of these greater interoperability, we have to try and focus on these commonalities, on these 
complementarities on these convergences in order to enable data to flow with trust across borders. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, Javier Lopez Gonzalez. Thank you for your participation. Now we will ask Caroline Luvo to make her, her comments, but I will briefly share with you her bio. She is a Chief Privacy Officer of MasterCard and she is leader of the global team for legal compliance and regulations on privacy and data protection. Caroline was a key player for MasterCard for the regulations of uh, data protection of the U European commun community as well as other actions that have to do with uh, personal data transfer. She contributed to the creation of Truata in order to provide analysis and data confidentiality in compliance with regulations from the EU. She has great experience working with the design private protection and is uh, and her advisory at MasterCard with respect to data protection has been key. Also including data portability and open banking, digital identification and new technologies. Also automatic learning among other things. Caroline is member of the advisory committee working with the implementation of privacy guidelines of the OECD. And before joining MasterCard in 20, uh, 2007, she worked at the private sector and uh, she specialized in competence. So with no further ado, uh, we want to welcome Caroline Luvo. Thank you. Muchísimas gracias. And hi, everyone. I'm delighted to be part of this fantastic panel on data flows. So this virtual panel could not take place with, without cross-border data flows, right? Cross-border da data flows is now the lifeblood of our global digital economy. And if we take the retail ecosystem, it heavily relies on global data flows at every step of the process to process your payment transactions, to protect you from fraud, to provide you with 24 seven customer support, to ensure business continuity, and the list goes on. This is the world we live in. MasterCard is a global payments and technology company. We transmit and handle the transaction data of millions of cardholders and merchants every day. And to make, can you still me hear me? Yes. So to, 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 for our payment network to work properly, the data, transaction data needs to flow freely across borders. Every time that you travel and you want to pay with your MasterCard card, your data travels back and forth between your bank, the merchants, and MasterCard. MasterCard is also in a unique position to monitor and to detect fraud because we have access to vast amount of transaction data across a multitude of financial institutions. And I'm sure that many of you have already received a text message from your bank at some point that it has been potential fraud on your card. Well, think about it. In order to gain fraud insights, right, we must collect and share data from across the globe. Why is that? Well, first, because more data gives you better predictions, more accurate fraud insights. But also because, as we know, cyber attacks are global. Very often, a massive fraud attack starts in one part of the globe and quickly spreads to other parts of the globe. 
in a record of time. So all payment data must be collected and shared so that we can connect the dots and so that we can detect potential fraudulent transactions in real time. Now, what are the challenges that we face? Well, while we see more and more laws emerging all around the globe about how data can be collected, used, and shared, we also face higher fragmentation of standards. And that leads to a high degree of complexity to the detriment of businesses and citizens. And in particular, we face increasing restrictions on cross-border data flows and increasing data localization requirements for companies to store or process their data on soil. And that results in bad outcomes for everyone. It leads to an increase in expenses for companies, in particular for SMEs, and ultimately an increase of cost for consumers. It can negatively impact safety and security, and it can lead to a reduction in innovation and choices for people. So what's the way forward? Well, the good news is that we can have both free flows of data and at the same time have the data fully protected end to end. And to get there, the public and private sector must commit to accountability when handling data. So what do we mean by that? Well, it's about protecting data with the high privacy and security safeguards. And that's the what. Wherever the data goes, and that's the where and implementing the tools and the controls to ensure effective compliance. And that's the how. So for the industry, having accountable data protection programs and data transfer mechanisms can take many forms. And if you think about it, that's exactly what binding corporate rules are all about. BCRs is, as you all know, a code of conduct endorsed by data protection authorities in Europe that allows a company to receive and transfer data outside of Europe and across the corporate group. Well, MasterCard has BCR in place for all our activities, and we outline in our BCRs how we're going to um, comply with the GDPR standards wherever the data is going to be located, and how we're going to ensure effective compliance. So, for example, by making sure that we have executive buy in, by implementing policy standards providing transparency uh, to customers, to our people, training the organizations about our BCRs, monitoring compliance, and having mechanisms in place to remedy any potential non-compliance so as to respond to complaints and to offer redress to people. Now, this is also what APEC CBPR is, is all about. The APEC privacy framework requires companies to have their privacy program reviewed and validated by an approved third-party organization and accountability agents. So MasterCard has both APEC cross-border privacy rules and privacy rules for possessors. And both of them, plus our BCRs, really help us build trust and confidence from our customers, from our investors and our consumers. And we've actually won major deals thanks to the fact that customers thought that their data was better protected with MasterCard. So it works. But even standard contractual clauses or ACCs can get you there if combined with a strong privacy management program to ensure that the clauses are effectively implemented. And again, at MasterCard, we have SECs. Um, for example, when we deal with third party suppliers or in jurisdictions where RBCRs or, or APEC CBPRs are not yet recognized. But let's face it, whether we rely on RBCRs, on APEC CBPRs, or on SECs, we protect the data with the same high privacy and security standards. We have one single global privacy and data protection program that acts as a foundation. And while we adjust our program in local markets to ensure that we meet the local standards, there are no major changes, no major variations in how the data is protected under all these different data transfer mechanisms. But there is definitely a lot of administrative hassle and paperwork and cost that has to be done in order to achieve each of them. 
And I'm not even talking about requirements to have a copy of the data on soil or to fully protect uh, or fully process and store data on soil. So at Mastercard, we are privileged. We have a global team of privacy professionals that are fully dedicated to monitoring these changes and ensuring full compliance. And this is getting more complex every single day. But if we can afford to hire armies of privacy experts to enable these compliant data flows, how are SMEs dealing with this complexity? And does the complexity truly help enhance consumers' privacy? This may sound a theoretical conversation, but it has real life implications. So according to a recent article published by a robust medical journal, numerous medical studies and numerous research projects on cancer have been delayed, suspended, or negatively impacted due to challenges relating to transferring data out across borders. And this can impact patients who are the beneficiaries um, of the research, and it can also impact any of us or any of our loved ones. So practical solutions are definitely needed. And I'm, but you have heard from Javier, you have heard from Clarisse, there's hope because we see a lot of convergence already. So let's work on it. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Carolyn, for your participation. Now I would like to give the floor to a space for you to pose some questions. And there are some other questions that are coming from different people. And uh, you let me know who would like to answer the question. The, fir the first question I have here, which would be the most important uh, principles that should be adopted to be able to protect the private data in, in international transactions might be used for a common standard. Who would like to answer this question, please? I don't see any hand. Clarice Giraud, could be? Could, could you like to answer the question? Anyway, I'm not sure I can answer this question in such a straightforward manner. Um, I think what we have heard across presentations, unfortunately, not always very clearly because of technical issues, is that there is no single way to address data transfers globally. We need a wide array of solutions for governments, for data protection authorities, and for businesses to do their work properly. I think we have already a number of frameworks and international principles, starting with the OECD privacy principles and, and many other principles that have been adopted by the International Conference, the Global Privacy Assembly, the so-called Madrid principles, we have, of course, the, um, the APEC privacy framework adopted on the basis of the guidelines, the ASEAN uh, framework for, for data protection, and then, um, of course, um, Convention 108 of the Council of Europe and uh, GDPR built on it. So we have countless principles. There's no need to invent new ones. I think what is extremely important, just like what Javier uh, mentioned earlier and Caroline insisted on it as well, is that let's focus on the commonalities at the level of implementation. And let's be creative, I guess, um, inventing, for instance, new tools like digital uh, economy agreements, which Zikin uh, mentioned earlier, so that we have a wide array of solutions to enable um, data transfers globally. I think I will stop here because I'm not sure I answered the question directly and I don't want to take the floor for everyone. Let's continue now with another question. And this is the following. Which is the role played by the overseeing authorities in 
private personal protection to develop mechanisms for international cooperation for the review, implementation, and based on the law in private uh, data protection in terms of uh, trans cross-border flow of data. Who could like to answer this question? I, I will try, although I did uh, sort of specify in my introduction that I, I was perhaps not the lawyer or the privacy person on the panel. Um, but let me try nonetheless. I mean, I think it's important to have overseeing authorities in these areas. And one of the things that we find in terms of our commonalities, and perhaps relating to Danilo's presentation and talking about Brazil, is that there's a huge amount of overlap between the GDPR and the approach that Brazil is currently taking. However, when we search through behind those principles, we start seeing that the implementation on the ground is very different from the GDPR and to Brazil. So I just wanted to highlight that there's one thing which are the principles which are very important and they will enable building trust, but overseeing authorities and the institutional backdrop is very important as well to enable that element of trust. There's another question that says, is it, is it possible that this GPA could set a model for interoperability of the different uh, means in terms of pri personal private protection. I could like uh, whether um, Caroline could like to take it. Caroline, could you like to take this question? Would you like to tackle this question? I think this is a fantastic question, Francisco. At least, I don't know whether it's possible, but it's a dream. And I think we need to hope for at least the work to get started. And I think, I mean, it seems that we are all in alignment that is already, there is already a lot of convergence. And so we have the foundation to find compatibility between these data transfer mechanisms globally. And we are very happy to be part of this network. Which are the flow, uh, cross-bordering data, which are the protectionist and restrictive measures that you see for data transfer that takes place in some of the countries? Would you like to answer the question? Maybe Clarice, could you like to answer the question? Would you like to answer the question? Or Javier, maybe? Or both? Okay, Javier. Javier, you go. I'm going to take that question but in a, perhaps a different way. I mean, many people claim that measures are protectionist. But protectionism is very often in the eye of the beholder. And it's very difficult to identify where you draw the line. However, in this area of protectionism, something that I find very useful is to draw lessons from international trade agreement in the sense that you can define protectionism when a measure becomes discriminatory. So, for example, when you discriminate between domestic and international actors or when the measure that you put in place is disproportionate to the objectives that it aims to attain. So what I would like to say is that in this area of uh, protectionism, while we shouldn't be pointing fingers and saying you are protectionist or you are not protectionist, I think that one useful way of engaging dialogue with people is to ask the question, is this a discriminatory measure? Is this a measure that is disproportionate in terms of trying to achieve. And once we answer those questions, then we might be able to identify pathways for resolving issues around this idea of uh, protectionist measures. Thank you, Javier. There's another question. Which are the main benefits in regards adopting flexible mechanisms for compliance as certifications 
of transboundary border rules in ASEAN and the acknowledge mechanism for processors or the implementation of contractual clauses method. Would you like Clarice to answer this question? Yes, certainly. Um, I, I hope I got it right. Um, I think if we're talking about certification generally, um, what we see in Asia definitely, and particularly in ASEAN, Southeast Asia, um, certification is a possible way forward. Um, in the study that we did at the Asian Business Law Institute, we actually showed that many legislations either in force or um, in the making are actually capable of supporting certification mechanisms. ASEAN has a plan for certification, but right now the priority is really, but Zikin could say more to this, is on model uh, contractual clauses. That said, it's very important that every single data protection law with data provision, data transfer provisions yeah. in them, actually recognize a wide array of data transfer mechanisms, including certification. And it would be, personally, I think a mistake to discard certification as a valid data transfer mechanism because it is on the contrary a very promising one including for processes i will leave it at that thank you would somebody would like to supplement this point maybe caroline caroline would you like to add something and or yes. seeking um i I wanted to confirm what Clarissa said about the importance of certifications. Today, let's, let's be honest, if there's one drawback about BCRs and CBPRs, it's a marketing problem. If it's complicated for me to explain this to my CEO and for any non-expert to even remember the name of it, it's very unlikely that people have any idea about what that means. And that's the benefit of certifications. So let's explore certifications, trust marks, and seals for companies that have accountable data transfer mechanisms. That will help build trust with consumers, customers, investors. So companies would be incentivized to go the extra mile and seek that certification, or to only select partners and suppliers that have a certification. Investors could use that in their investment decisions. And it would be easy for consumers to make informed choices about what companies to trust and what companies to share the data with. Muchas gracias. Zikin. Uh well, uh, I'll, I'll just quickly supplement on, on two angles. Uh, within ASEAN, uh, there is definitely plan. There are plans to uh, develop an ASEAN certification system. Um, as Clarice mentioned, uh, we are focused now on adoption of the model contractual clauses, which were only introduced nine months ago. So. Uh, uh, is still quite a bit of work to do to promote that. Uh, we are very optimistic because um, today, three countries have got data protection laws. Last time I counted, uh, we have another three or four other uh, ASEAN member states who will be introducing data protection laws. Uh, when they are done, more than half will have data protection laws. And I think that would be a good time for us to uh, take another look, right, and take the next step 
to build certification systems. And um, the reason why I say this is really from the experience of having implemented uh, certification systems within our uh, local laws. We designed our data protection trust map to be integrated with the API cross-border privacy rules and the PRP system so that companies who want to achieve both, it is just one simplified process. Uh, this is help, um, something that uh, data protection authorities can do to support and facilitate um, certification. Something else that we can do, uh, which is something uh, common uh, between uh, Japan and Singapore, is to introduce regulations that recognize certification as a transfer mechanism in and of itself. So by looking at a certification, that is all you need. You do not need contracts anymore. That is good enough. Japan uh, uh, took their approach for APEC CDPR. We in Singapore have done the same thing. And the more uh, uh, countries implement uh, APEC CDPR that way, the better it is for our uh, uh, companies. There's a new area that I hope to be able to explore with like-minded data protection authorities to see how we can link up and mutually recognize domestic trust maps that are already in existence. So that can be another way of using a certification as a transfer mechanism across borders. Um, uh, from a data protection authority uh, point of view, uh, certification is a step up above better than uh, contracts. Contracts, even though we standardize, are bilateral and it's really dependent on the party to the contract to police that the contractual terms are actually implemented. When you have a certification system as a data protection authority, I have greater assurance because there is an independent auditor who is going to look periodically at your processes to make sure that you're in compliance. So that is actually great and actually uh, that is a, a, a more durable way of building a trusted network for cross-border data flows. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Okay, we'll have now the final round. And if you agree, Javier, what are the measures or law updates for the free and effective flow of data across your region? So maybe each one of you could share something in order to try to start wrapping up the session. Javier. OK, thank you very much. I guess. Um, from the perspective of the work that we've been doing, one of the key elements that we identify and has been said by others is that there is not one single way of approaching this. So for me, what needs to be done at the moment in order to identify more interoperability is to focus, as we've said earlier, on those commonalities Emergencies. But I think one of the key elements here, which I would actually like to also query all the other analysts on, is uh, how do we uh, make progress where we are seeing uh, an area such as trade agreements putting in the divisions and privacy discussions taking place in, pri in parallel, but then not really bridging themselves together. And I guess that for me, one of the key elements that needs to be done at the OECD or at other places is to enable further discussion on cross-border data flows we trust across different policy silos. And one of the areas that we are taking forward at the OECD in a horizontal project on data governance is precisely that. And in putting together the different policy communities, the OECD is organized a bit like so we have the competition, we have the trade, we have the science technology. We're putting everyone together into one project to try and see whether we can learn from each other's approaches in order to identify 
a means of uh, interoperability and obtaining cross-border data flows with trust. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Would you like now to make a comment or Clarice or who would like to go first? Just to make it interactive, who would like to go? Clarice, then Caroline, Me again. and then Ziking. <laughs> Okay. okay, I thought Caroline would take precedence, but I'll jump first. Um, I think Javier said something very important. We have to break down silos. Silos between different policymakers in different areas. And to be honest, I think we need to go a bit further than just economic regulators because in many areas, including in Asia, but also elsewhere, um, the human rights component still remains extremely important. And human rights only or trade only will not be federative. So we need um, to have as many people in the room as possible, but then not to chat and chat forever. We need concrete solutions. Um, we have discussed a number of them for data transfer mechanisms. They have been around for a long time and they work. What we would like to see is to move the conversation towards more concrete areas. And that is uh, to work on the compatibility of other provisions in data protection laws. Because interoperability of data transfer mechanisms is one thing, one way of facilitating data flows. But ensuring the greater compatibility of other key provisions in data protection laws will also facilitate cross-border dealings. Zikin mentioned earlier in one of his slides um, an attempt to reach a common interpretation of the term of legitimate interest, for instance. Uh, we are looking at the Future of Privacy Forum, we're working on a project where we're precisely looking at that, trying to bridge the differences between consent requirements in the Asia Pacific and beyond to propose alternatives to facilitate cross-border trade but also improve the protection of individuals and maximize opportunities for cooperation for data protection regulation. If the OECD would like to take part in this conversation or support it, um, I'd be all in favor. And I well, I propose that we continue this conversation after the session. Thank you. I think we need to remember the the outcome that we want. We want to build trust. Trust among governments, among companies, so customers, partners, and trust for people. Now, how do we get there? So we need indeed some tools. And one of them could be to have data transfer mechanisms, like OBCRs, for example, recognized are certified in other jurisdictions. This is not that hard because we've heard that there are lots of convergence and commonalities, but we need to have the willingness to get there. And we would be more than happy to participate in a working group to get to, to these tools and build that trust. I want to thank Caroline. I want to thank Clarice, C, Javier, and Danilo for this wonderful exchange of ideas across regions. According to all of you, of course, data transfer is possible. So thank you, everybody. And now we'll proceed with the program. And thank you very much for your time.